really glad that you're here with us today as we are in our last week of our series, What Next? Uh, learning how to navigate uncertainty. And I don't know about you, if you're a person who really wants to follow God, it seems like it's a lot more difficult to follow when circumstances point to maybe the fact that God isn't interested in being followed. I mean, he seems to be maybe waving you off. Maybe the circumstances around you, maybe it feels like you're not being rewarded for your efforts. Have you ever felt that way? Uncertainty often leaves us confused as to how to approach God. He seems so quiet. We're not hearing anything. We're not feeling a direct message. He seems so still. We don't feel movement, maybe like we have in the past. He seems distant. And it just begs the question, well, does he want me to follow him or not? Some days I want to end my prayers with, so what do you think? So what are you going to do? Like you heard my opinion now, God, what's yours? I want to know. You ask God to change maybe the, the heart of your child and, and there's no answer. You ask God for a better work situation and it seems like it's getting worse. You don't want to spend the rest of your life single and yet it doesn't seem like anyone's coming into your life. You don't want to spend the rest of your life with your spouse unless he or she or something changes. And yet it seems like that's not going to happen. And the Bible, let's be honest, at times makes it seem simple. In the Bible, we see that God kept appearing and saying to people, hang in there. When things aren't great, it's tempting to think, that he's not interested in the details of my life. Now that raises two questions. What is God up to when he's so quiet? And the second question, what are we to do in the meantime? We've said so far, if you've been here over the weeks, that the first thing you and I need to do in times of uncertainty, what, the, what we see in scripture is that we need to pray honestly before God. Then we need to remember, remember his faithfulness in the past. And then last week we talked about our need to seek his kingdom and his righteousness, to, to seek after those things and make those remember what our true priorities and values are. So today is the most difficult and yet the most obvious. Today we're going to learn that in times of uncertainty you and I are called to follow. Why follow? The Bible, in my experience, makes uh, one thing very clear. God does his greatest, his most significant, and his most deepening works individually and corporately during times of uncertainty. Your favorite Bible stories, your, your favorite Psalms, and, and your most comforting passages of Scripture were birthed in times of of uncertainty. God was not absent during these transitional times. He was, he was more active than at any other time. And in each example, these men and women's lives were interrupted. The familiar, the predictable, the, those things were wrenched away. And the structure of their lives disintegrated. And there was no doubt a sense of panic. It seemed like God had fallen asleep at the wheel and in the middle of what felt like total chaos to the people around. He showed up in ways that we are still marveling about today. You read and, and you watch their faithfulness and you, you wonder, what if they had abandoned God? Think of what it would look like if they had missed that. God was at work and they would have never known. From God's perspective, uncertain times are opportunities to do something in us. He can do more in us during times of uncertainty than he could ever do in the normal 9 to 5, everything the way it ought to be kind of times. And why? Because if we're be honest, that all of us are idolaters at heart. 
Like we all have this natural propensity to, to lean in and trust in the things that we create or are created by, by others or rather than in the great creator. Our job tenures, our businesses, our finances, our 401ks, other investments, our, our networks of friends and, and associates, our families, and our good health. All of these things represent structure and familiarity and order. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we were made in the image of God, and so we have a natural uh, design that makes us want to create order from chaos. But... They can become uh, comfort zones, and they wean us away from our dependency on God the Father. So when God comes along and He shakes our structures and allows them to be shaken, we panic. And in our state of panic, we do things. When our structures are shaken, when, when we move through transitions, that's the times it seems like when God um, has our undivided attention. When God has our undivided attention, that's when you and I are positioned to grow like crazy. Suddenly what's real, what's important, becomes the focus of our attention. It's then when He is all we have that we discover that actually He is all that we need. From God's perspective, uncertainty creates opportunities to do something through us as well. For God to accomplish something great in, through us, we must respond correctly to times of uncertainty. I want us to look at a story. It's a story of a boy who got it right. He's a favored son who became a slave, a slave who became an inmate, an inmate who became a prime minister, and through 13 years of uncertainty, he remained faithful. It's the story, do you know? It's the story of Joseph. Now, I don't know if you guys know the story, but one of the things you'll see uh, throughout this is amazingly how it keeps saying through the story that the Lord was with Joseph. Now, again, if you don't know, Joseph was one of a lot of sons, but he was favored by his father. Very dysfunctional family. We're not talking like a little bit favorite like a lot favorite, like he got away with everything. Uh, his brothers were sent to work and he didn't have to work the same amount. He was given better clothing. Uh, his, they, they had some family issues, okay? And what we see in this story is that his brothers became very jealous of him. Um, and when he came to visit them one time, they conspired. They were going to kill him, um, as jealous brothers might do. And then last minute, instead of leaving him for dead in the bottom of a well, or a cistern, they decided they were going to sell him into slavery. Oh, how nice of them to do that, right? And then he goes into slavery, and before you know it, he's in prison. But all the while, it said the Lord was with Joseph. Now, God didn't say that to him. It's in the narrative text. But it says that he was faithful as a slave. He was far from home. And, and through these experiences, experiences, it would seem, you would guess, that that he felt very far from God. It seemed, didn't seem like God cared, right? First of all, his brothers betrayed him. Second, he gets put into slavery and is, and is a slave for quite a time. But then we, we see in this story, and, and if you aren't there yet, you can turn to Genesis chapter 37, and what we see in this uh, in this passage now again, it, this story goes from Genesis thirty seven through forty seven. So it's it's a it's a long story. But what we see is this: as a slave, uh, Joseph ends up in a man named Potiphar's house as as a servant. He becomes head of that house because of his uh, diligence and hard work. And the wife of Potiphar tries to seduce young Joseph. And it says in verse 9, Joseph says, how could I ever do this to this, uh, to my, you know, to my master, this one who I serve under? And then he says, and I, how could I sin against him and sin against God? Now, I read that and part of me thinks, Joseph, like, you mean the God who abandoned you, right, to your brothers, that God? But Joseph 
believed that God was with him. And Joseph said he could not sin against that God. And guess what? God rewarded him. Uh, he rewarded him with being framed for rape. And so, Joseph gets thrown into prison for something he did not do. But what we see in, this is crazy, what we see in, in the following chapters there in, in verse 40, um, or as we go on, we see that he was faithful as a convicted criminal. He followed God even in that uncertainty. He's, a, he's in prison, and there are these men who have dreams, and, and Joseph is faithful. And he says, you know what? Dreams belong to God. Wait, you mean the God that let you be framed? To be thrown into prison? You see, Joseph continued to be faithful and to act in such a way like he, he you know, that believing that God was with him. And so he was faithful. He interpreted these dreams. They were helpful to the ones he interpreted for. And guess what his reward was for being faithful? He was forgotten in verse 23. He's forgotten. He, he asked the, the people he helped, hey, when you stand before Pharaoh, talk to him about me because I'm in here and I didn't do anything wrong. Speak on my behalf. They forgot. So two more years go by. For all he knows, he's in prison forever. God's not answering his prayers. No one's, uh, you know, there's no answering answers appearing. There's no signs. There's no miracle. There's no voices. There's nada. Nothing. And then it says this, After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And then further on, verse 15, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Joseph, I have had a dream, and there's no one who can interpret it. I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And so, what does Joseph do? He does... I guess what anyone would do if they believed that God was with them. And so he was faithful as a servant to Pharaoh. He um, answered the dream. He interpreted it. And you can see, if you look at verses 16 and 25, 28, so Joseph says, God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. And so Joseph, even though he has gone so long in his life, where it seems like he's doing everything right. He's living as if God is near, and yet he's not getting the rewards that you and I might expect, and yet he's still faithful again and again and again. And because of that faithfulness, though, at this point, things change. And next thing you know, he becomes the prime minister of Egypt. All of the things he had done in his past, all of this time, and all of this uh, development of him from a boy into a man. And now, and now, we see that there is a purpose in all of the things that he had gone through. That, that the time he spent in prison was not wasted time, but rather that he was there so that when Pharaoh had a dream that he could not have interpreted by anyone else, the Pharaoh might see that Joseph's God can answer and save lives. Now, what's, I think, the most interesting thing about this story, I mean, all of that is, is pretty crazy. But what we see is that actually, as fate would have it, even though it's not fate, it's God's story, as God's plan would have it, Joseph comes back, uh, his family comes back into his life. So, Joseph, if you don't know, the dream that he interpreted of Pharaoh's was one that predicted that a famine would be coming. That there'd be a couple of years of, of good harvest, good crops, but then there was going to be uh, several years of really bad, like famine, and there wouldn't be any food. So the idea was that they were going to need to store up food in order to be able to save people's lives and save the country and the region. And so, because of that, when this famine hit where Joseph's family was living, they traveled to Egypt in order to buy 
and get grain to get food. And so this is what happens in chapter 45, uh, verse 1 through 9. It says this, For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. This is what Joseph is saying. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here. He's talking to his brothers. He's saying, the wrong that you did, you thought you were doing something. It's actually not you, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and rule over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. What does a wounded brother do when he is confident God is with him? He saw God in the midst of all of this uncertainty and he responded, accordingly. This is chapter 50, verses 15 through 20. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? So they say, so they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of of the servants of God, of the God of your father. This Listen, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. Listen, just to cut to the chase, do you know what Joseph did through his 13 years of uncertainty? He conducted himself as any man in his circumstances would who was confident that God was with him. He assumed God's hand was in the uncertainty. He accepted the uncertainty as coming from God. For God to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in your uncertainty, in our uncertainty, we have to see him in it and respond accordingly. Joseph saw God in the transition, and consequently God was able to work through his transition that lasted over 10 years. I think we need to hear that today to give us perspective, okay? We are languishing over six months. Joseph struggled and was in uncertainty for 10 years. Not to say I want to follow in his footsteps. I'm just saying. 10 years, right? And so, listen. Joseph didn't see himself as a victim. He saw himself as a player. He didn't know it, but he actually would end up having a leading role. He was the point man of this very significant work of God. Because of Joseph, his whole family and lineage was saved. And the Hebrew people were giving, given a huge area of land to, to lay down roots and to prosper and to live. Our response to uncertainty needs to be like his. And now I know you might be saying like, well, my boss and or my ex-husband, listen, my children, you don't know like the way the school is, or my teacher. Listen, here's the deal. They have, might have meant how they've treated you for evil, but you can rest assured that God will use it for good. And so I have to ask the question, I think this is the question this text brings about for you and I. How would someone in your situation act if they were confident that God was with them? You don't have to respond that way. I mean, you could get mad at God. You could, you could shake your fist in the sky and say, you messed up my life. You ruined my plans. I had big dreams. I had a, I had a vision board for 2020 and, and it's wrecked, right? You can resist the idea of trusting and believing and you can, you can try to take control over things. 
And you can miss what would have, uh, you know, what he would have done and could have done if you had only surrendered to his unknown purposes and plans. Uncertainty, listen, my friends, is an, is, uncertainty is a fact of life. And it's not evidence of, of God's inactivity. This may be his most active time, nationally and personally. This is not the time to doubt. This is the time to cl follow closer now than ever. And the good news is this. Your Heavenly Father is the master of uncertainty. He does this all the time. He's in control. And He has something in mind for you and, and in, for your family and, and His kingdom. The fact, you can trust Him. So live as a man or a woman who is confident that God is with you. Pray. Remember, seek, and follow. We're going to go into worship, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Listen, I, I know, I know. Easier said than done. Joseph knows. We look at his story and we see somebody who's not making excuses, not getting angry or bitter. Joseph is also not a superhero. He came from a broken, messed up, dysfunctional family. That should give a lot of us hope, right? He came from a lot of dysfunction and he had his hand in that too. He was not innocent of it. He went through injustice and was treated wrongly. He, he was part of a, a corrupt system. All of the things that you and I could point to and get angry at and lose hope over. But in all of the places that Joseph found himself in, 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 these, uh, in the, the waves and the currents that pulled him and moved him, and he had no control over, like many of you maybe feel that way, whether it's nationally or internally or personally in your own life, Joseph, what sets him apart, he was just a man who did what any man would do if they were confident that God was with him. And the things that you're going through right now, I just have to tell you, you can go through those and you can choose to do what any person would do if they believed God was with them. What does that mean for you? I don't know. But I'm going to pray. And I invite you to pray with me. That, that you would actually embrace that attitude, that trust, that faith, to believe that. And some of you, maybe you're like, well, I'll be honest with you. I've done the church game for a long time. Um, I kind of like the habit of it, or it makes me feel kind of good. I like the advice at times but you've never really fully embraced this idea of surrendering control and choosing to trust and believe that God is who he says he is, that Jesus was who he said he was, and that the cross did what he said it did. I'm going to pray for you as well, and I'm going to invite you to have a prayer, a moment where you fully trust and embrace who God is and what he would like to do in your life. For you to surrender and let go of control and embrace and trust the God who created you and his son Jesus who redeemed you through his death and resurrection. To do that and then to go into whatever it is in your life right now, trusting and believing that God is with you and making decisions in your personal life and making decisions in, in the world around you and how you look at things, not through the limited context of what you can see and what you can control, but rather making decisions like anyone would do if they were convinced that God was with them. Let's take a moment and we'll pray. God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the time that we have together. 
and these stories. Scripture is full of stories of uncertainty and uncertain times and times where the, the currents of this world were out of control, the chaos around people. And we see, God, people who are not perfect, who are not, did not have superpowers, uh, did not have amazing character or strength, but rather people who just had faith and trust that you were with them and they held on. And so, God, for some of us, that's how we feel right now. We're just holding on. God, may we make decisions believing that you are with us, that you are in control. Not only do you want to do something inside of us, but you might be preparing to do something through us, something bigger than we could ever imagine for ourselves, to put us in places and positions where we could have influence and leadership, where we can enact real change and where we can be a blessing to many, many people. Maybe positions where we can change the dynamics of our families for, for forever. To break the, the chains of addiction and habits and dysfunction. Maybe we are that person to take that on. Maybe you are doing something in us to change the course of not just our lives, but generations. We need to do what anyone would do if we knew that you were with us, that you were watching, and that you were close. God, I ask that you would help us to have that kind of faith. Even when we don't feel you near, even when we don't feel like things are changing or that we're not being rewarded for doing what's right, God, we pray that you would use this time of uncertainty for good. God, for those of us who maybe, uh, we've maybe considered ourselves spiritual or religious and maybe even Christian, but when it comes to actually living a life where every day we have a sense of your, uh, of your closeness, where we live our lives knowing that, that we are living uh, in your sight, uh, that, God, you are watching and you care, uh, to live a life in, that is following after Jesus, to, to pattern our life after his, and also to live um, with the gratitude and faith, knowing that he died on the cross for our sins, that his resurrection is just a, a moment that changes history and also is a promise to us who follow Maybe that hasn't actually changed our reality. Maybe we haven't been living with that reality in our minds. And maybe we haven't accepted Jesus to, uh, as Lord and Savior of our life to, to be the one we follow, to be our rabbi. Some of us, maybe today, we're just saying, okay, I'm done. I'm done trying to control it. I'm done trying to make life work and make the uncertainty go away. I'm tired of trying to make myself good enough for God and good enough for people. Maybe there's some people who are just at the bottom and just saying, I need something new. I need something different, and I need life. God, I just ask that your spirit would meet with them. God, I just pray you'd reveal yourself as real and true to them, that they would see your son Jesus for how amazing he is. God, I pray that they would sense your realness and your closeness and that they would have a faith that sprouts like a newly planted seed, like something that is new life that would spring up and well up from their heart, and that, God, it would grow from just a warmth in their heart actually through their entire body, and that they would know that you are real and you are who you say you are, and that, God, they would say yes to you, that they would lay down everything and choose to follow you, give their life to you, and to make you king. I pray that for them. And uh, God, we thank you that that's how we get more brothers and sisters into this family is by your spirit growing something new in people's hearts. So God, we thank you for what you're doing in our church. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. God, in all of the uncertainty, we thank you that we can follow after you and that you are working, you are moving, even when we don't feel it or see it, God. And you're calling us to follow, to do what anyone would do, if they knew that you were with them. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. So if you prayed today, and it was a, a pretty significant prayer, um, just so you know, you can message me directly through uh, our online service, or if you're watching this after the fact, uh, you can send us a message. Again, you can go to anchorbuffalo.com and go to contact us, and you can send me a message if you'd like to talk one-on-one -on -one more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian, um, or if you are just in a lot of uncertainty 
and you need someone to speak to and uh, just need a, an ear, uh, I would be happy to do that. I would love to do that. And so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Okay? But with that said, my friends, I'm so glad you joined us on this journey of our series, What Next? And I pray that today and then this week, you'll go out and you would do what anyone would do in your circumstances if they were confident that God was with them. Grace and peace, my friends, and we'll see you soon.